We're going to start our recording. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our April PTSA meeting. We have only two meetings left in the year. Um, we're glad that you're here. Hope everybody had a wonderful spring break. And thank you for joining us uh, right after spring break ends. So we do appreciate it. Uh, we have uh, some great um, things that we have to cover tonight. We're, we're, we're pleased to have a wonderful presentation um, um, after we complete uh, a few uh, items of business that we have to. So the presentation tonight will be on uh, building critical adulting skills in high school. So it's an excellent presentation. We look forward to it. Um, so first, um, you know, we're going to cover uh, the May meeting. We're going to talk about a session that we set up for um, we're sponsoring for rising ninth graders. That's an information ses session for those uh, parents of uh, incoming ninth graders from both Cab and John and Frost. We'll talk about post prom, the buses for graduation, and uh, and some open positions. We do have our election next month, and then we'll turn it over to Miss Bolden for uh, Miss Bolden's updates. And uh, we can go to the next slide. So for our final meeting of the school year, um, we have uh, Amy Smith coming to present from Power Hour Editing to present on how to find and communicate your wow factor in your college essays and activity lists. So this is a great uh, presentation, just in time for the summer for our rising seniors who are working on applications over the summer to work on their college essays and uh, activity lists and resumes and getting all their um, uh, documentation together for their college apps. Moving on. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we're, uh, PTSA is uh, sponsoring a, the Rising Ninth Grader Information Session. It's coming up on Thursday at 7 p.m. So if you have a Rising Ninth Grader, we hope you can join us. Please spread the word. Ms. Bolden and other Wooten staff will be presenting. So bring all your questions and there'll be a lot of great information about um, coming uh, to Wooten. So we're, we're excited to have the session and it will be recorded and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you're not unable to make it, it'll be there available um, on demand. Next slide. So PTSA is working with um, a group of parents to, per, uh, to put together a post, a really fun and safe post-prom event. Uh, normally, there's a committee that gets established early in the school year for post prom, but this year it was not established. It wasn't, uh, you know, we were unsure as to what would be happening uh, over the course of the year and whether uh, prom would would be moving forward. And fortunately, it will be moving forward. So prom will be taking place on Saturday night, May 20, 21st. Um, and then immediately following prom, uh, early morning, on Sunday, 12 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. Uh, we'll be having a post-prom event at Bowl America in Gaithersburg. It's a great facility, large facility. They have 48 lanes. Uh, there'll be casino tables, a green screen, a DJ. Uh, the students will have arcade games to play. It'll be a really fun night. And, uh, and we're hoping to give out a lot of great prizes. Uh, because the, the committee did not get established early in the school year, um, we're very limited in the amount of funds that we have available for this. So we are asking parents to help us out, and we're asking for contributions, either funds or great prizes. So if you own a business or you know businesses that maybe would be willing to contribute, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, the goal is to have our seniors spend the evening there. So rather than other activities, they have a really fun and safe event. Um, and the prizes uh, are a great draw. I mean, all the fun activities that we have there are a great draw, but certainly the prizes uh, in past years, that's been uh, the, we've given away a TV, iPad, um, a lot of gift certificates and, um, and things like that. So um, you know, if we don't get donated uh, prizes, we'll, we'll use funds to buy those prizes, but, um, but we could really use your help. So if, uh, you know, if you're interested in making any kind of donation, you can let me know um, at uh, PTSA president at Wooten. You can see the address there. You can find me on the wootenptsa.org website. 
Uh, we are expecting uh, a PayPal link to be set up very soon, and then that link will be used for, for donations. So, um, so thank you for uh, considering any donations. Next slide. Um, so PTSA um, uh, puts together the graduation buses for um, helping to get parents and guests down to DAR Constitution Hall. Um, it, it saves on the on on driving through traffic and finding parking around DAR Constitution Hall, which is always a little bit difficult. So it's a really easy way to get downtown. Uh, the cost is fifteen dollars per person for PTSA members and twenty per person for non-PTSA members. And um, the buses will leave about 1245 from Wooten. So uh, if you have a student graduating, uh, please uh, consider um, riding the bus and you can go to the Wooten PTSA website to, to buy your tickets now. And, uh, and finally, um, PTSA has a number of open positions, um, quite a few coming up. So in May is our election. Right now, we have, uh, as far as I know, um, and I'm on the nominating committee, uh, we don't have any body running. So we would really appreciate um, everyone considering helping us on PTSA. We have for the executive board, uh, first vice president, second vice president, recording secretary and treasurer, um, you know, all very key positions. Uh, and then if you, know, if, if you don't have as much time to contribute, and uh, you know, we certainly have some other openings, uh, the graduation bus coordinator position is, is for a one-time event. Membership and directory co-chair is a key role to help us um, with the membership drives and, and uh, the directory. Uh, we need a fundraising chair to help us with fundraising. Uh, we have, um, we're working on purchasing the tile floor for uh, the gym, a portable floor for um, events that occur in the gym. And, um, and so we're continuing to raise money for that. And uh, our fundraising chair will help us get there. Um, we need a website co-coordinator, uh, the Latino Parent Student Network Liaison and the Asian Parent Student Network Liaison. So those are some key positions. Um, very important positions. They don't require as much time. Um, all of these positions uh, are participants on the board, and the board does meet um, for a short time once per month just to touch base on um, upcoming uh, activities. So please consider, um, we will be uh, sharing this information with our rising ninth grade parents to see if we could uh, interest any of them who are coming into Wooten next year, if they would be interested as well. So, but we appreciate you considering um, uh, contributing some of your time to helping PTSA and the Wooten School community. And now the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Bolden for any principal updates. Thank you so much, Brian. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see you. And I wanna echo what uh, Brian said. I hope you had a wonderful spring break. Uh, it was a very, late spring break. And so we're coming back to uh, the last, uh, the fourth marking period. And um, as, as you can see, there's a lot of activity happening with all of our uh, closing events for our seniors and also in wrapping up the school year. So I just have a few updates for you and just reminders about the busyness of this uh, end of the school year. I don't have to tell you that, um, but just some specifics that are coming up to put on your radar screen. Um, first and foremost, um, as, as uh, Brian said, we have a number of events planned for our seniors. Uh, we are so excited that they are able to um, participate and engage in a lot of the events that we typically hold at the end of the school year, including our senior picnic, our prom, and of course, graduation. I think senior planning is doing a couple other fun events um, between now and then. Uh, and of course, post-prom, and I can't thank the PTSA enough for jumping on the need for post-prom. And I really appreciate, uh, again, the heavy lifting that they're doing um, and everyone involved. So if you could donate, volunteer, uh, we certainly would appreciate it because it's so important that we have a fun, safe event for our students after prom. So anything you can do to help out, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, in addition to um, all of the the senior pieces uh, you do on the website, we are looking at our summer institute for our ninth, the rising ninth through 11th graders or ninth through 11th graders rather. Um, there are some really exciting opportunities 
um, for our juniors we uh, who are ri our rising seniors. We always have um, different events that are happening to help with the college process out of Ms. Carr's office, the college and career information coordinator, anything from writing the essay to doing Common App. Um, so please look for those opportunities. Um, most of them are either a half a day or a whole day. They're free of charge, and it really is to support our kiddos as they're moving through and um, that process of, of college applications and finding out careers and all of that. So um, just keep your eyes out for those um, updates as we um, continue to work through our, our Summer Institute information and regional summer school. So there are lots of options there. Uh, in the immediate future, as in next week, uh, we start testing uh, for end of year testing. And so there are state testing um, events that are coming up Monday, April 25th and Tuesday, April 26th. Uh, we'll be testing our 10th graders in the English literacy um, assessment for, and is one of the assessments that all students have to take as a graduation requirement. We will offer some delayed openings for those days because of the number of students involved and the number of proctors that we will need in order to accommodate testing. So we'll be put out some messaging about that rather soon um, so that you're aware that there will be a change of schedules for those two days. Um, in addition, after next week, we go into AP testing. And that's always the first two weeks in May. Um, our students have worked hard this year in their AP courses, but over the course of their years, it's a cumulative exam that um, we typically have about, we administer about 3,000 tests um, in the first two weeks of May. Um, Mr. Joe Mamana is the AP coordinator and you've probably received lots of communication from him. If you have a student who is in AP courses, um, I bring it to your attention because uh, there, while we don't have changes of schedules, um, we do allow for students who are taking tests in the morning, they don't have to report to school in the afternoon or vice versa, um, and just trying to get, accommodate a little bit of relief during those two weeks of testing there. And we are going back to USG this year. So um, for some of the tests, because of the number of students we're testing, we partner with the University of Shady Grove and students can will go there to do some of their tests. But um, please talk to your students. We did some meetings right before spring break with them just so that they'll know what to expect, um, what they need to bring, all of that information. Um, and really, I just encourage um, all of you all just to spend some time with your kiddos and, and see what they're doing in terms of testing and what support they may need. And then after the two weeks of AP testing, told you there was a lot of testing. I wasn't kidding. Um, <laughs> we come back for in May 24th, May 25th, the 27th and 28th for um, a, additional state testing. So um, we wanted to work around AP testing. So on Tuesday, May 24th, we will do MISA, which is the integrated science assessment. And that is for our ninth and 10th grade students. Um, Wednesday, May 25th, that is the government test. Um, and so that is for any student who's in government that can be ninth through mostly, primarily ninth and 10th. And then we have, we have our algebra test for our students who are in currently in algebra class, May 27th and May 28th. And again, we'll have some delays on two of those days, the 24th and the 25th, to accommodate the number of students we have testing. Um, and so that is primarily the testing that is coming up end of April and into May. Um, and in addition to that, of course, we have our end of the year ceremonies, Festival of the Arts is coming up. Uh, we will have our awards ceremony coming up um, and just some really fun and festive activities to celebrate all of the great work that our students continue to do over the course of this school year. Um, so those are my immediate updates. Please look for some connect eds with all of this uh, information in it so that you can wrap your minds around all the things that are coming up. Um, and I will look forward to seeing everyone at our coffee chat on 
Friday, April 22nd at 9 a.m. Um, I'm very excited to hear what's on your mind and, and answer as many questions as I possibly can during that time. And finally, I just want to say hello to Jody again, Jody Klaus for sending and to say thank you to her and her team for coming this evening and spending some time with us and talking about adulting. It seems appropriate uh, as we move into the, the, the spring months. Um, with all that being said, thank you so much again for um, your partnering with us and, and, and our working through this school year together. So with that, I wish you a great evening and um, turn it back over to you, Brian. Thank you. And, uh, and I'm going to be turning it over to Jody and Andrea to talk about beginning to build critical adulting skills in high school. So uh, over to you, Jody. Thank you. Okay, so I will share my screen uh, because I have a presentation ready for everybody. And let me get the slideshow ready. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the screen. Um, so yes. today, yep, you can see it great, cool, great. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about beginning to build critical college skills. Um, I am partnering with Andrea Malkin-Brenner and uh, Andrea, why don't you start us off? Um, I, I don't know if I can be seen. Can I? I don't think you can. Okay. There you are. <laughs> Am I there? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is um, Andrea Malkinbrenner, and um, I was a Whitman parent, not a Wooten parent, um, but thank you for having me nonetheless. Um, my background is a bit different than Jody's, and she'll tell you about hers as well. Um, I have a PhD in sociology, and I was a sociology professor at American University uh, for 25 years. Um, and uh, after that, I became a college administrator at American University. I built a use uh, first year experience program. Um, following that, I left campus after 25 years, uh, wrote a book called How to College with a colleague from American University. Um, it's a leading guide for uh, students as they're heading off to college. Um, and it's been well received, which has been very exciting. Uh, a lot of schools are using it as a first year reading book. Um, and my newest product is called the Talking College Card Deck. Uh, I see a picture of it on the screen there. And these are prompts for conversations between college bound students and their parents. So my name is Jody Glau. I am a former Wooten parent. My younger son is actually graduating this year from college. He's, uh, has, he, he went through the AOIT program and he's actually graduating in com computer science uh, with honors. So, so thanks to Wooten for everything that you've done to get us where we are. Uh, so my background, as Andrew said, is a little bit different. I come from it, uh, I, I was actually also a professor at American University, and then I actually shifted over and started teaching at uh, Montgomery College, where I helped students um, through the writing process in their um, basic English 101, 102, and 103 classes. But I also worked with students as they transferred from Montgomery College, which is only a two-year uh, associate arts program, to baccalaureate programs, which are four-year degrees. Uh, by doing that, I really started to um, work closer with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis to find the right college fit for them. And that's how I developed Custom College Consulting. I'm located in Rockville, basically a half mile from Wooten. And I help families and students really navigate the college planning process. So as uh, you heard earlier, we're getting really down to the nitty gritty, especially for our, our seniors who are making their final decisions and our juniors who are really getting ready to embark on the uh, college app process. But there's more to the college uh, planning process than just going into college. So that's kind of why we're here. We're talking about transitioning to college. And Andrea, why don't you tell a little bit about that from your perspective? Absolutely. So um, Jody and I like to say that learning to do laundry is not the most challenging part of the transition to college. 
And I think if you read lots of these lists that you might see on um, Grown and Flown and other websites, and again, I'm, I'm a big fan of those. I, I write quite a bit for Grown and Flown myself. Um, a lot of them lead with, uh, if, well, if your kid you know, learn, knows how to do laundry, they're, they're heading in the right direction. Um, and of course, that is an important skill. Um, I do find that most of the students I work with um, already know how to do laundry uh, while they're still in high school. Um, but quite frankly, uh, learning to do laundry is not uh, the most challenging part of the transition to college. Um, the college transition really become, begins after admission to college. Um, and Jody and I are gonna dig into that tonight. So basically one of the reasons that Andrea and I have teamed up is because that we have a really uh, two distinct perspectives. And today we're gonna talk about these unique perspectives as well as how we can look at them through uh, two different ways. So the first one is uh, the high school focused and a college focused professional. So um, one of us is basically focused on the high school experience and um, planning for, for college. And the other one is more college focused, of course, which is Andrea. Andrea sees where, where students have failed to thrive in their first year of college. I work with students in high school to prepare them for college. So our joint perspective benefits both the student and the parent as they embark on this journey together. So Andrea? the other, yeah, absolutely. So the other perspective um, that we talk about is the parent and the student perspective. So just like uh, Jody and I have the high school centric and the college centric student perspective, here we also have the parent and the student perspective. And one great example that I like to talk about is college move-in day. So the parent often says, it's the last day that we can spend time as a complete family. And I can't tell you how many times I helped with college move in on the American University campus. What I would see is parents who were um, grasping for every moment to take pictures uh, with their student in their new surroundings, um, in the dining hall, in front of the student sign, in front of the student union, uh, in their residence hall with their siblings. And there's always one more picture. Um, and the way the parents look at it, and there's nothing wrong with this, is this is really the last day that we spend as a complete family. Of course, the new college student is looking at the exact same day through a different lens. Um, for them, it's the first day of my new life, and I want to explore and meet people. And again, there's nothing right or wrong about either of these perspectives, but the work that I do um, really focuses on talking with students and with parents about these different perspectives and how they can start communicating with each other. So defining roles for the college, the college student, and the college parents vary greatly. Um, if you look at a U.S. college or university uh, mission, you will see that the college really defines itself very clearly. And actually, most missions look pretty similar to one another. They talk about themselves as an institution of higher education. They talk about themselves as uh, creating leaders of the future, um, creating students who are involved in and outside of the classroom. Um, uh, colleges also in their mission to find the role for college students. It's pretty clear what the role is for a college student. Uh, they need to meet certain academic criteria to gain acceptance. And then they are, once they're um, looked at as a member of a community, they have certain standards and regulations. They need to follow an honor code or an academic code, et cetera, et cetera. So clearly the roles for the college and the roles for the college student are clearly defined. But when it comes to the role of a college parent, it's really not well defined. And it's actually quite different than the role of the high school parent. And so a lot of the work that I do, and I know some of the work that Jody does as well, is we talk about that chasm in between. We know what the role of the high school parent is, and parents know that role when they're in it. And colleges sort of say, all right, parents, it's time to back up. But nobody really does a lot of that teaching to the parents of how to move from their role as a high school parent to their role as a college parent. So there are five myths that go along with being a high school uh, parent. And we're gonna talk a little bit about them now. So the first one is that college ready kids excel both academically and socially. 
And uh, while, of course, uh, most college ready kids probably excel either in academics or socially, rarely do we see kids that are prepared for what is waiting for them on the other side of those college gates, um, both at the, at the same time. Some of them might excel more academically and more prepared, while others are ready to, to hit the social scene and know how to interact with other students and their professors a little bit better than others. Another myth is that no one at college will get my kid like I do. Well, yes, you may be correct because of course, as a parent, no one gets your kid like you do. However, college faculty and staff have worked with tens of thousands of students over the years. And while they might not know the nuances of your specific student, they also have seen mistakes that are commonly made by students as they enter college and um, are quite adept at guiding them through this transitional process. And we're gonna talk a little bit in this presentation about how we can rely on colleges and their resources. So the third uh, myth is that teens don't want to learn from their parents. And actually it's probably the opposite. Teens might not necessarily want to admit that they don't know what they don't know, but when they are given clear talking points and prompts for conversations, they realize how much their team, how much their parents might have to offer by way of advice and their own anecdotal stories. Um, this is one of the reasons that I love working with Andrea's deck of cards um, called Talking College Deck. Uh, it's so talking college card deck. It's so helpful. Um, even if a parent isn't as familiar with college, maybe they didn't go to college or maybe they didn't go to college even in the US and they went to college somewhere else. And even if it was back, you know, when, when uh, many of us went to school, it's changed quite, quite drastically. And this can, they can provide insight into what it was like when they left for the first time, when they left home, whether it was for college or another reason. And uh, the next one is that the college process ends with acceptances. So as um, if many of you have seniors that you'll see right away that, that that's actually not the case. While May 1st is considered decision day, um, there are many resources that will help with students as they head off to school. Um, I work with many families. I work with many Wooten families. And while they are finalizing their decisions, uh, college counselors like myself, and I'm sure Mrs. Carr and other resources at Wooten are really there to help students before they head off to school and um, kind of it's almost too late. In my practice, I work from the very, very beginning when I start working with students on these adulting skills and then throughout their different experiences. Sometimes they are um, more ready than others and it depends on uh, timelines. So the last myth is that other people's kids have it all together. And I think that you know probably through the years, especially on social media, that um, only the most exciting and rosy, rose colored moments are posted on social media. And perhaps you're thinking that the grass is always greener, but that's not usually the case. If this was the case, there wouldn't be so many people that are really um, struggling to thrive in college. So we wanna prepare our kids the best we can before they get there. So thriving in high school and especially in college matters more than just surviving. So thriving is actually different than existing. Well, college, colleges are actually starting to develop a thrive index. Uh, right now, many, many people look at retention rates as the success for a school. And retention rates are only a small measure of success. Um, yeah, they are coming back maybe second semester, but we want to make sure that our students are happy and successful. Are they making friends? Are they active members of the university community? Um, are they are they healthy and happy? And that I, I actually like to say that a healthy and happy B student is going to be more successful 
than a straight A student who isn't happy and healthy and really stressed out and lonely. Uh, so colleges have started developing more and more first year experience programs. As Andrea mentioned, she actually created the first year experience program at American University, but now 80% of colleges have some sort of first year experience program, and these help freshmen with their transition to college, but it's important to try not to wait until they get to college. Andrea? Sure. So what can high school parents do now uh, to help their teens? And um, really what I spend a lot of time talking about is not waiting until the summer before high school and uh, summer after high school ends and college begins. That as early as sophomore year um, and certainly well into junior and senior year, parents can be working with their high school students to help them prepare for college. So we call these the big six. So the first one is make sure your teens have the simple life skills they need before arriving on campus. And these are things that parents can teach regardless if they have been to college in the United States or not. So here are some things that high school graduates should know. How to keep a budget. That's something that can be started. Um, Jody, I'm gonna go one by one if that's okay. Um, so how to keep a budget is something that can be started, a uh, conversation that can be started as a prompt, uh, talking about money um, in the family, but high school students can take a week and they can record all of the money that they spend on anything from Starbucks to um, food shopping for the family. Uh, these are things that you can fill them in on, tell them how much things cost. Um, anytime that they run over to CVS to get something, you know, really to record the amount of money that's spent, because that's going to be very, very useful in college. Next is how to use a phone to make appointments, ask for help and leave a voicemail. We have not been raising uh, kids in this generation who are phone savvy. Um, they're text savvy for sure, but not phone savvy. And that's something that's gonna be a big part of their college experience when they are making an appointment uh, for an office hours with a professor or a graduate TA or their advisor. A lot of times they're gonna be expected to use the phone. Um, making appointments for haircuts and dentist appointments are a great way to start. And if you have a student who's got some social anxiety issues, there are ways to sort of chunk this and do it slowly. Um, for example, Example, something I was just working in a parent workshop and a, a parent, um, a family I was working with who had a student who was really anxious to use the phone but knew they needed to improve their voicemail leaving skills. Um, the first time they sat down to call the dentist to make an appointment, they did it on speakerphone and the student listened while the parent made the appointment for the student. The second time that an appointment needed to be made, maybe for a haircut, uh, the parents sat there on speakerphone while the student did the talking, but the parent was there just for support. And then by the third time, the student was able to do it on their own. So whatever kind of um, needs your student would have, um, those are skills that that can be built. Um, and rem remember that uh, those skills, even if they're not using them in high school, they're gonna be really, really important in college. How to judge their stress to distress spectrum. That's something I like to talk about. I, I believe strongly that there is a spectrum between stress and distress. And stress is a normative feeling and emotion that is a really large part of um, the first year of college, if not beyond. Um, and students should understand that stress is something that everybody is affected with. But distress can be problematic. And everybody reaches distress at a different point on the spectrum. And that's an important thing to work with your kids um, in high school and understand, help them understand when their stress turns to distress. Stress is usually something that through wellness practices, meditation, taking time off, uh, listening to music, watching um, Netflix, taking a walk, exercising, those are ways to reduce stress and that usually the student can handle by themselves. Distress is not something we would expect a college student to handle by themselves. And we would like to set them up with resources, whatever those might be, to, um, to help them if they're, if they're moving into that territory. Next is memorizing their social security number by heart. 
um, the safest place to have their social security number, which they're going to use quite a bit in college, um, is actually in their memory. Um, and I'm always amazed when I work with high school families, how few high school students have memorized their social security number. And that's just one of many things uh, to learn how to keep private, things like banking information, passwords, uh, learning about um, unsecured Wi-Fi networks. Those are all an important part of transitioning to college. How to write address and stamp a handwritten note if your student doesn't already know how to do that. That is absolutely something that they're going to want to learn how to do. How to treat common physical maladies, understand medication dosages and fill a prescription. If you're the one who's been filling prescriptions for your student, they should really be starting to do that towards the end of high school because that's something they're gonna be responsible for in college. And of course, how to take care of themselves when they're sick not even talking about COVID, just talking about the common cold that um, runs through every freshman residence hall. Um, there's no way about it. Every student gets sick their first year of college with a cold, for sure. Um, and the last thing that a student with a high fever wants to do is, is roam around CVS trying to figure out what kind of medications they need to buy over the counter. So, you know, setting your student up with um, not only um, some medications, uh, over-the-counter medications that they can take with them, but understanding of medication dosages. The basics of health insurance. This is something I talk about in my Talking College Cards. I have a whole section on health. And um, again, this is something that amazingly students in focus groups uh, at the end of high school and the beginning of college always fail at. They know very little about health insurance and that's gonna be something that they need to know um, when, they, when they enter college. So these are great prompts for conversations when you're stuck in the car with your kid uh, or at a dinner table. Simple meal prep, cooking, baking, toasting, microwaving, and knife skills. Maybe some of your students already know all this, but if they don't, um, almost every freshman residence hall is equipped with a kitchen and they should be heading off to college with a recipe from home, something that gives them comfort um, and the skills to learn how to cook that. How to book plane, train, and bus travel. Maybe that's something your student already does. Um, but again, they can sit with you the first time and by the end of high school, they should really know how to do that on their own. How to follow directions or a map to get anywhere. Of course, our students rely on technology um, and you know, certainly GPS or, or map app on your phone, but um, college, and you'll note this when you go on college tours, it's one of the only places that still uses hard copy maps. Um, and that is something that's really important that a student knows how to do that how to care for and clean their own bodies and personal spaces uh, seems obvious, but there are a lot of high school parents that still need to remind their students uh, that it's time to shower uh, or do their laundry. And that's something that they're gonna need to do. If your student is not someone who has uh, done a lot of cleaning in their own home, uh, that's something they're gonna have to be doing in their residence hall. So they should know the difference between a glass cleaner and the surface cleaner and begin to learn those skills in high school. And finally, how to shop, compare prices, read nutrition labels, and understand the shelf life of food. Again, another skill to learn before college. So this is just a list. Jody and I picked some of these. These all come from my book, How to College. Um, you can find lots of lists like this online. You'll probably come up with some on your own. When you look at this list, I'm hoping that some of these you think, whew, my kid already knows how to do that. And others, they don't know how to do that, but I know how to teach them. And so these are manageable skills that students should have. Okay, and next is uh, helping your team become more responsible for themselves with far less nagging by setting milestone markers. Now, these milestone markers are just a way for you to measure your students' progress toward independence. It's important to note that these are only suggestions and um, really it's for juniors and seniors to see, okay, well, where have they, have they hit this yet? Do they still have more work to do? So some students have them down before they even start senior year of high school. Others may need a little bit more time to address them even the summer before heading into college. So you need to decide what milestones work best with your family. Uh, and that is a personal decision before moving uh, forward. So the next thing we want to talk about, we're going to split these up between administrative tasks and health and wellness tasks. So some of these are the milestones that we were just talking about. And let's talk about some administrative milestones that you might want to consider. So the first one is moving from parent to student management of maintaining a daily monthly calendar 
deadlines, attending meetings, filling out form, sending emails, and packing lunch. So as a college counselor, I start working with students on, the, on many of these milestones from day one, uh, especially having them deal with their own, the management of a calendar and deadlines. So uh, my students are responsible for making their own appointments and um, knowing when things are due, they, they do get reminders. But when working with a college counselor, we have long-term goals and long-term projects, very similar to college. And so that is how that I kind of work with students to set that up. So sometimes I'll have a student that will show up at an appointment, for example, and they haven't done any of the long-term projects, but they have made an agreement with me that they have to you know, be prepared in advance. And that's something that really does help students when they get to college so that they know how to self-regulate. They know maybe they study better in the evenings. So maybe they'll um, do some of the, they'll, they'll maybe work earlier and then they'll study uh, better late at night or vice versa. Maybe they're early risers and they'll get up early and they'll study that way. Um, however, it works best for the students. Attending meetings. So as far as like um, meetings are concerned and knowing what to expect, whether it's, you know, anything from a job interview or a meeting about something, you know, if a student has a meeting at, at school with a, with a teacher, that they're part of it, that they aren't left out, that they are looped in, um, and they know the proper way to conduct themselves during these meetings. Filling out forms. There's so many forms in in high school, I actually heard about some of them mentioned tonight. You know, you're going to need to have, I know that a lot of students have to fill out permission slips or whether they're applying to be part of, you know, a club or National Honor Society and they need to fill out things in order to get accepted. Uh, it's something that they need to become familiar with. Sending emails kind of similarly to what Andrea was previously saying as far as raising our kids um, using proper um, voice etiquette. While our students are very tech savvy, believe it or not, they're actually not very email savvy. And there is a proper way to send an email, kind of like a business letter format. So uh, we practice on how to send proper emails and not just like, hey, it's me. And uh, so that they know how to address their professors and how to address any professional that is out um, in, in the world. Um, and then packing lunch, because a lot of times students don't necessarily want to eat what is in the nearest dining hall and they want to pack something healthier. Um, practice now, practice whether or not you're going to be going away for a, on a car trip on a weekend. What do they want that's maybe different than their siblings want? And come up with, you know, a meal plan that goes, you know, with their, their dietary restrictions or what they prefer. Okay, um, learning that the nuances of administrative responsibility and planning ahead take multiple steps. How many reminders until I let them fail? So this kind of falls along the lines of long-term projects. So perhaps, you know, if a student is writing an essay, they're not expected in college to just submit an essay. They need to learn brainstorming. They need to learn outlines. They need to learn, you know, the multiple step process. And that's the same in anything that they're doing in the real world. It's not just a one and done. And um, how many times should you let them fail? Like how many reminders do you need to have them do before? Like make sure that you make your doctor's appointment. Don't forget to make your doctor's appointment or um, don't forget your lunch. Don't forget your homework. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that there's many of you out there who've had to run to Wooten with a lunch bag in hand, with a late assignment, but is it benefiting the students to um, have that, to kind of pick up the slack, or should you let them fail at something that isn't, you know, as earth shattering now, so that way when they go to college, it, it doesn't really sneak up on them. Andrew, do you want to build on any of those examples? No, I think you did a great job. All right, so why don't you take the health and wellness? Sure, so just as Jody said, we've got some milestone suggestions uh, for health and wellness tasks. 
So moving from a parent to student management of any medical or behavioral diagnoses with direct, not secondary contact with health providers. That's a lot of language. What do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is that students should be stepping up certainly in their senior year to make those uh, not only doctor's appointments, but to um, really have conversations with a therapist, a, um, a medical doctor, a gynecologist, a dentist by themselves. Um, and that's a very, very important part of the college transition process. One of the things that they're going to be doing there, uh, freshman fall, is they're going to be making their flu shot appointment uh, that will be required by their school. Um, and that's something that they're going to actually have to do, learn, learn how to make that appointment, how to show up, um, understand what's happening to them. So the earlier, the better. And although parents can certainly request uh, being there, once the student turns 18, that's something that they should really be able to handle on their own. And then moving from a parent to student management of simple things like sleep-wake cycles. Are you still the one waking your kid up in the morning um, or are they getting up with an alarm? Um, and that's a, that I've actually seen um, some, some rough situations where parents and through senior year were still waking up their kids or telling their kids what time to go to bed. Um, and that was a problem because then uh, the students were starting to rely on their roommates in college uh, to fill that role. Um, so these are things that students should do. And even though it may give us as parents um, a wonderful feeling to be able to, you know, talk to our kid at the beginning and the end of the day, that's something that they're going to need to take responsibility for themselves. Uh, responsible social decisions. Um, of course, our students are going to um, have a social life in both in high school and in college. And the earlier they start making responsible social decisions in high school, um, certainly there will be rules and regulations that you set while they're under your roof. Uh, those rules, uh, those rules will hopefully carry through and they'll become rules of their own in college. Um, daily self-care. Again, I mentioned earlier things like showering and taking care of their physical space. Um, probably the toughest one would be time management. Um, that's probably uh, what is harder for um, high school, uh, first year college students than um, any other year, um, mainly because they'll have more time outside of the classroom than ever before. So number three, normalizing mistakes and helping your team to safely learn from them. So I think part of the problem of overparenting, or you may have heard the term snowplow parenting, um, is that what we do as a society is we often just sort of clear the way, just clear the path for our kids. So there are no mistakes that they just sort of step over hurdles rather than going through them. Um, but we're here to say that that's not necessarily the best way to focus on the transition to college. And here are some common first year college student mistakes. And I could pretty much guarantee that every first year student is going to experience most, if not all of these, their first year of college. So the first one is losing something important. Uh, that might be something as dramatic as a um, wallet or a credit card or laptop. Our cell phone um, could be a student ID that's replaceable, but it could also be something like a winter coat. Um, so keeping track of things rather than um, doing them, you know, having our students keep track of things rather than us finding those things for them um, and joking that they always lose things. That's something that's really important to do by the end of high school uh, because there are certainly consequences for things. Um, every time a student loses their student ID, for example, they're paying $20, $25 on a college campus to get that replaced. The next one is having technology failures, very common amongst uh, college students. Um, and again, something to be expected, um, hopefully as few as possible. But um, good news here is that you can plan in advance with what would you do scenarios? What would you do if your cell phone is cracked? Is the first call going to be to mom or dad? Or are you actually going to have a plan that you've already talked through and the student knows how to figure out how to take charge? The other thing to know about this is that there is an IT office that's usually open 24 seven on every college campus. And so if they can't get into their uh, portal to submit a paper electronically, or if they're having trouble with their laptop, there's almost always gonna be someone to help them. Poor caretaking of their health is a big one. Um, 
you know, nutrition is not something that is uh, first and foremost in a lot of first year uh, students' minds. Uh, the freshman 15 is alive and well, um, and that is because they have access to things like pizza at all hours of the day. Um, just because there's a fitness center on campus doesn't necessarily mean that the student's going to use it. So really having conversations in advance with your students. Um, I have a whole section on health and wellness in my uh, Talking College cards, but regardless if you have those, there's always something that you can pull out and talk about that you know is important to your student, about health, about wellness, about sleep cycles, about fitness and diet. Those are important conversations to have before the student leaves home. Not budgeting or overspending, that's a really, really important part of the process um, because the student will have a certain number of meal swipes, for example, and what happens when they run out? Um, do you have um, any kind of budget planned for them? Is there an allowance? Um, are they paying for certain things and you're paying for others? I've seen so many situations where I've been called um, by a first year college parent who says, oh, we forgot to have the conversation about where all, um, who's paying for Amazon purchases, right? Because it doesn't look like real money. It just, it's just kind of there and you can just click and and, it, and this, this new item arrives. So these are conversation prompts that are really important. Um, I talk about in a lot of my work, I know Jody talks about as well, but not budgeting and overspending is a really common first year mistake. Next is making a poor social decision, which I um, spoke about earlier. And then finally, missing or failing an assignment. Um, again, very common. And you do get a call from your student, especially in the first semester of college, you said, I had no idea the paper was due today. Everyone else in the class seemed to have it in their hand, ready to turn it in, and I did not know. And part of that is um, that they're not used to the college system. And the college system, unlike in high school, there is not a teacher who's going to remind them by email or on the boarding class. Don't forget, you have a chemistry test on Wednesday. You know your essay is due on Friday. Um, college is very different. There is a syllabus that's given out at the beginning of every semester. The student is responsible for when all of those due dates are. There are rarely reminders. And uh, that is somewhere that students really struggle and uh, finally find their way. And number four, try to avoid scenarios where too much helping hinders a high school student's growth into young adulthood. So I don't call it overparenting. I don't like that term, but we do talk about too much helping. And as I said, um, we can kind of rewrite that narrative of overparenting, maybe calling it loving support versus detrimental enabling. Um, I think that's a little bit of a nicer way to say stop overparenting. It's something that we as parents all do very often. Um, and why do we do it all out of love, of course. And also we do it because we haven't really turned off that fixer mode, right? We've been a fixer since our kids were very, very little, um, often through K through eight and maybe even into high school. And it's something that's uh, really tough for a lot of high school and college parents to turn off. How do we stop fixing the scenarios when we know we're probably better at it than our kids are? And then there's a picture of a teacup here. And this is sort of a college insider uh, scoop I wanted to give you, which is that faculty and staff across colleges in the US um, call students, um, first year students, who are so fragile that they break teacups. So that is a word you will hear um, kind of behind the closed doors on college campuses when someone will say, oh, I have another teacup who came to my office today, meaning that um, these are students who just don't have the ability to bounce back after a setback. So the gradual process of moving from dependence to independence. And I think that there is a fallacy that it, you know, a student should be going from dependent to independent overnight. And of course, that is not the case. So I want to show you an example, which might seem a little out of place, but listen, there is a method to my madness here. And what you're seeing here is a chart that you might recognize if you were someone who um, breastfed a child and then eventually weaned them. What in the world does this have to do with the college process? Well, actually, it's a really great um, visual of what college experience um, college students experience when they move from being dependent to being independent. Again, it doesn't happen overnight. And just as we weaned our child from nursing to solid foods as a gradual process, um, we do the same thing as we sort of wean our kids from being dependent into 
um, young adults who are going to be dependent. What I ask parents I work with to do is to step back as our college student begins, but simultaneously encourage the um, student to use the campus resources. So you might have been the first and foremost person uh, that your student calls or texts for help when it comes to mental health, to physical help, to um, anything um, uh, revolving around emotional health, questions and answers. And what we want to do is we want to have them rely on people on the campus. There are ample resources on a college campus. Jody's going to talk about some of those in a little bit. And the goal here is to wean them from us as parents and introduce simultaneously sort of this hard food, right? The solid food and the solid food would be the campus resources. So let's talk a little bit about the differences actually between high school and college academic standards and help teens, help teens to hone those skills. So we're going to go through several of them in a minute, but you know, one of the things that I think is shocking for a lot of students right off the bat is that they're really used to having a lot of daily assignments, having a lot of time in class to do their work, um, spending obviously, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, a lot of time um, in class in general. But uh, when you're in college, as you know, many of you are familiar with, sometimes you only have a couple of grades, maybe a midterm and a final, maybe you'll have a project here and there, but there aren't all of those daily grades that go and make up those homework grades. And that's really shocking to a lot of students as, as well as some of the other things that are just you know, uh, thought of as this is something that they should know. Many students don't really know that there's going to be a significant difference in academics between high school and college. So let's look at some of the primary differences. Okay, so first, Andrea also mentioned time management a little bit. And, and here you can see the, the a, a really big difference. Okay, so in high school, as we know, school begins and ends at the same time each weekday. Okay, except when we have late starts, we all know that, right? Um, so it's approximately 35 hours of class per week in up to seven subject areas. Okay, that's something that they're used to, and they've been doing it pretty much since middle school. So there obviously was a big shift between elementary school to middle school to high school. Now they almost have to go through that again when they go to colleges. So classes in college are most likely going to meet one to three times a week, and the schedule also varies daily. So approximately 12 to 15 hours of class per week in four to five different subject areas. And also depending if there's gonna be breakout sessions, recitations, labs, things like that. All of those um, are at different times through, throughout the day and different times during the week. So their days may never look the same. Okay, so now let's look at professionalism and personal responsibility. In high school, parents might contact teachers, counselors, and vice versa, but in college, the student and the student alone is responsible for being in contact with all professors and academic resources. In fact, parents are not allowed to uh, contact anybody from the school. Um, there are areas where there is a release that they can sign called PERPA, but that's, um, there's, uh, that's something that we'll address in a little bit. But basically, um, Parents are hands off. It is close. It is strictly the student responsibility. So back to high school. In high school, teachers often send out reminders of when work is due. That simply doesn't happen in college. Uh, students are responsible for all of their deadlines. So I encourage uh, parents to let the students try to. Um, handle their own reminders and make them accountable for any of the work that they have to and the deadlines that they're responsible for. Okay, in high school, many assignments throughout the marking period to assess progress in grades, as I previously mentioned. Um, feedback in college is much less frequent and often requires attending office hours and um, to assess pro progress in grades. I, I have heard from many of my past students who called me up um, in October saying, I still don't know what I have in this class. I am completely stressed out. And I remind them of some of the tips that I gave them earlier, that as long as they're studying and keeping up with all the things that they need to for future midterms, 
um, that they're going to do just fine. Okay, preparation for class. Uh, in high school, teachers will often explain re readings and relevant concepts in class. Um, that goes anywhere from math and, and breaking down problems to English, where you could actually read Shakespeare along with your classmates. Um, but in college, that's not something that's going to happen. The student is expected to understand most of what they read before class. And sometimes they'll even have reading before their first day of freshman year. So I usually encourage students to, you know, see what some of the past syllabi are from the professors that they're going to have if they know who, what their class schedule is in advance so that they know how to be prepared. Um, that they're also ex expe expected to attend the, you know, each and every lecture and discussions because that's the only way that they're going to know what's expected of them outside of the classroom. So even if the teachers aren't necessarily reviewing everything in class, and maybe what they're discussing in class isn't necessarily what's going to be on tests, there is a syllabus that hopefully will outline everything there is for the student. And if there isn't, it is really the student's responsibility to make sure that they go in to meet their um, professor during office hours or their TA during recitation or breakouts. Okay, help your teams to learn and practice writing professional emails and leaving professional voicemails. So both Andrea and I have addressed this at different times. During this presentation, um, it's great if you can have them practice on, on maybe family members or even um, writing an email a thank you note of some kind. Um, unfortunately, handwritten thank you notes are slowly falling by the wayside. Um, but, you know, even colleges actually prefer to get everything uh, written via email. Um, so it's really important to understand that writing an email is just like writing a business letter. And so make sure that you, you know, that your student knows the structure of the format and what is the proper language to use, as well as professional voicemails. So I had one of my favorite stories is that um, I had the first time I ever tested a, vo a student's voicemail, I called the student's voicemail while with the student um, sitting next to me. And because I said, do you have a voicemail set up? And she said, oh, it was boy, actually, he said, I, I don't know. So I called it and it and this young man had made a voicemail when he was five, six years old. I don't know when he first got his phone before his voice changed, basically. And it was, he was talking like this. And then he, now he was talking like this. And it certainly didn't sound anything like him. And so I explained what needs to go into a professional voicemail because you never know who's going to be calling. And it's great to have them do that before um, they even go to college, because as they're going through the college process, a lot of times schools are going to be calling the students themselves and you and maybe leaving messages and you want to make sure it's professional. Okay, academic readiness, junior and senior year milestones. So students should um, be taking ownership of their academic responsibilities without external accountability. Um, so parents need to retire as the uh, homework and the school police. Oops, sorry about that. And um, because if you're, if you're a parent who is standing over the, your student to make sure that every single thing that they write is correct, it's gonna, and, and that the writing is in a way that you think sounds more professional, it's going to sound like you. So they, the student needs to be responsible and accountable for their own work. Otherwise, it's not gonna sound like them. It's not gonna sound like, it, and they're not gonna have the skills necessary when they go to college. Um, so students and parents shift from focusing on grades to the process by which the grades were attained. So in, in high school, uh, your goal is, you know, most students' goal is grade centric. They are hoping to get A's. They're hoping to do well on the ACTs and SATs in order to get into a good college. Um, but when they get to college, it's more about learning what they're um, learning what's going on in the classroom and ascertaining and really understanding the process by which they end up getting the grade because that is going to 
end up what helps them in the workplace. So recalculate grades and the success um, equation. So success in college is more than just grades, as I discuss. It's really different. It's more of an individualized perspective. And every student might have a different perspective of what success in college is from maybe getting the, the internship that they so desire to being a part of a really interesting research project or research team to maybe trying to solve a community um, crisis that's going on in, in the surrounding area, being a part of the college community, interacting with professors, campus activities, and maybe even taking an upper level course that they never thought when they were a freshman that they would be able to take. And now they're not only able to take, they really understand and they're able to master that. Andrea. Sure. And last, the sixth of our big six is helping your kids learn that asking for help is actually an important part of adulting. So if you ask a high school student or a new college student what being an adult means, here, here's the response you're gonna get. They're gonna say, well, it means doing it all by myself, doing it independently, not relying on others. Um, that's one end of the spectrum. Other kids might say, it's a mystery. I have no idea what adulting is all about. But if you ask a bunch of adults what it means to be an adult, they'll actually say something quite different. They'll say, well, let me think about it. It means using my resources. The first thing I do when I don't know something is I Google it or I reach out to somebody who does know, right? I look for experts out there. I look for people who have answers. I don't try to pretend I know everything. And I ask for help. That could be um, in something academic, that could be in my job, but it also might be if there's a family crisis, what do I do uh, if there's an illness in my family? I'll reach out and ask family and friends for help cooking meals to doing errands, whatever I might need. And that's something that's really foreign. And what I like to encourage high school parents to do is to really try to teach that concept of adulting that parents use um, and try to talk students into understanding and adapting that adulting uh, definition for themselves. And it's going to be really useful if they do this because college is a lot about asking for help. So we're very lucky these days because colleges have so many resources. So you want to encourage your teen to explore these resources and reach out before they even arrive. Um, just because also many students are aware of these resources doesn't mean that they're going to use them. Resources like the Career Center, a tutoring center, disability services, professors, office hours, a writing center, health and wellness center, counseling services, even the libraries and resident assistants and faculties advisor, faculty advisors, they're, they're all there for the student to use. But without knowing and without, and without testing that before going to college, there might, students might have a little bit of trepidation about using them once they get there. So we wanna encourage them to take advantage of them because that will help them launch and to thrive as well. So which brings us to reflective listening. So one of the greatest ways of interacting with your teen is using these reflective listening techniques. Um, so think of a time when your student walks into a room and uh, they're very upset about a specific problem and they're, and they're, they're all heated and they're, and they're just going off um, about something. Um, it, maybe your initial thought is, oh, what can I do? How can I fix this for you? What, what do we want to do? That's, that's kind of the, the snowplow method that Andrea talked about earlier. But this isn't ideal. We want students to learn how to problem solve on their own. So instead of using that language, consider saying, do you want to just vent or do you want to have, or do you want to problem solve this issue? Because it is oftentimes just our job to listen. And that's all your student wants to do. They don't need us to fix their problems. They just want to vent. Andrea, why don't you discuss the I versus you mentality? Sure, so you heard the first, the vent versus problem solving um, idea of reflective listening. Another idea of reflective listening is trying to use I messages rather than you messages with your teen. So let me give you an example about that. Uh, maybe in your family, you've told your student that they can take the car as long as they remember to text you when they get wherever they're going. And then 
inevitably they forget to text you and you are angry. What do you do? Do you contact them? Do you call them? Do you text them? And you say, I told you to do X, Y, Z. That was an agreement that, that you and I had. I am angry at you for you not doing this thing. If you can actually flip your language so it, the student is not immediately on the defensive, hearing that I language, and start you using you messages, meaning that you, as the parent, are the one who is responsible. You've got the problem in this scenario. It's not your kid that's got the problem. And instead, the exact same scenario, start that conversation with the fact that you feel that, um, you know, I get really anxious when I don't hear from you when you promised me that you were gonna call. It's my problem, right? Me as the parent. I feel this way. I feel this way. And that's really, really important using that I message rather than that you message. You becomes defensive and I become something that as the parent you own. And it's rare that a teen is gonna turn around when the parent says, I feel a certain way and rebut. So what does this mean for the high school parents? Okay, so uh, T, oops, sorry, oops, my bad. <laughs> Tease out your specific teen's need, needs for growth and acknowledge that raising teens is challenging for most parents. So remember, not every area is going to need growth. It's important to figure out your own kid and what areas they may need additional assistance in order to reach developmental milestones. Um, because uh, that's something that is unique to every family. Remind yourself that your teen is growing up and not a grown up. They may look like an adult. And in fact, a lot of times, for those of you who have sons, they sometimes now will tower over you. Even sometimes daughters will tower over you and they look like adults. But really, as we know, their brains are not fully developed yet. So they really are not grown ups. So understand that the roles for high school parents aren't well defined and there's no room, there's no rule book in college as to how you are supposed to conduct yourself um, once your student reaches. Um, reaches college. So it's something that you're going to need to navigate together. So think about ways that your well-intentioned helping and problem solving might be doing your teen a disservice now. So that way they will launch successfully and thrive effectively when they reach school, college. So the final goal of all of this, uh, before we move to our concluding slides, is really to help your teen help themselves and take the central role as they prepare for the transition. And we're happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have or um, welcome any suggestions that you might offer um, as well. If you want, you can um, throw something. I, I think that as long as um, Brian, this is okay. If they wanna throw some questions in the chat, I, we would be happy to answer them. Um, and we can take a look at them. Uh, as we're waiting for some of the questions to come in, let me just uh, give you some of our information. So please feel free to follow us on social media uh, for updates, future webinars, and lots of articles and advice. So my website is www.custom-college.com. And here are my social media, um, uh, my social media names. Handles, handles, handles. handles <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Social media handles, feel free to take a picture or a screenshot of that. And I will also now uh, share Andrea's and Andrea actually is a special promotion that for all Wooten parents. Yeah, so again, my name is Andrea Malcolm Brenner. Um, I'm at ambrenner.com and there are my social media handles. Um, a couple of people asked to show my cards. So these are the Talking College cards that come in the deck. And there are hundreds and hundreds of prompts for conversations with college bound students and their parents. Um, and um, I did make a uh, discount promo code for $2 off a deck of cards uh, just for Wooten PTA folks. And uh, Wooten PTA is the uh, promo code. If you wanna take a photo of that, you can go to my website and order that. Andrew, we have a question um, about budgeting. Do you have any recommendations for budgeting or money tracking apps for high school students? Um, I'm actually not a huge fan of any of the money tracking apps that are out there right now. Um, I work 
quite closely with um, some financial wellness people. And so far I have not personally been um, an enormous fan of the um, existing ones um, for a number of reasons. Um, they don't really nod to the fact that even if your student might be able to afford things on the college campus, um, that they might have a roommate who can't. Um, and that's something that I actually talk about in my book and in my cards, the idea that um, Students are coming from fairly homogeneous high school experiences, but are moving into very diverse college experiences. And so even if your student can um, enjoy a meal plan and then also go out for dinner maybe once a week, they may have a roommate who can't get any food off the meal plan. And so I think budgeting is just a really touchy subject. I think it's much more of a family-oriented discussion uh, than a standardized one. Um, one of the things that I would do, as I mentioned earlier, is to um, begin early in a high school and ask your student to track a week of spending. Um, I would also um, let them know, you might want to show them receipts for the spending of food spending for your family um, for a week or show them the bill when it comes to, um, to uh, a dinner out, um, for example, and then think about how you want to focus on uh, spending um, in college. Um, a lot of students actually successfully use an Excel spreadsheet or they use a Google Doc where they share expenses with their family. Um, another way to think about it is different types of credit cards. There might be one credit card uh, that is a family credit card, um, and there might be one credit card that's just that student's credit or debit card that they take um, that they take responsibility for, even if you might, you might be able to look at it. Um, and I know quite a few college families um, where the student goes to CVS and all of the things that are on the list of um, pre-discussed um, required objects like uh, soap and body wash and shampoo um, and acne medicine uh, are put on the, uh, the parent's credit card. And then all of the extra fun stuff that the student might wanna add on, the luxury items that would go actually in the student spending. So that's something that you can think about well in advance of high school. Um, and if you have any specific questions that might relate to your family, feel free to shoot me an email through my website and I can talk you through it. Oh, we have another question. Do you have any recommendations for books on budgeting and time and or time management skills? I actually do um, like a specific book that really kind of was a little bit of an introduction. Um, just to give a little background, uh, I actually prefer a personal finance class. Actually, that's one of my favorite things. And I, I think that, you know, uh, I believe, I'm not sure. That's one. I'm, I'm pretty sure they do. Not as many colleges have them these days, but I really love a personal finance class. That's my favorite. But there's this book called No One Ever Told Us That. And it's basically money and life lessons for young adults. And the author is John Spooner. And uh, it was it's really helpful and really informative. As far as time management goes, I, I, I have to say that Everybody really handles time management very differently. So there is no one catch-all for time management skills. And of course, keeping, you know, some people like to keep uh, dates in their, um, on their phones. Some people need it written out. Uh, some people, you know, there's all different types of learners, visual, auditory, tactile. So to say that there's one method just for me, for what I work with for my students, I don't feel comfortable. In fact, I like to individualize time management for the student. I don't know, Andrea, if you found a different- Yeah, no, that book is great. I would also agree with that. Um, I do talk a lot in my book, How to College about time management and agree with Jody that is very individualized. And so it's really hard to sort of standardize the discussion about it. That said, um, there is an exercise called the 168 exercise that's used uh, by a lot of college counselors that are a lot of first year experience programs do it. And it's something that you can ask your student to do. And in a typical week of school, there's 160, well, there's 168 hours in any week, uh, even in an atypical week. But if you ask your student to keep track of every single hour of their 168 hours, um, and I actually map it out in my book, but it's certainly something that you can do at home. And you have your student figure out exactly how many hours they sleep, how many hours they eat, um, how many hours they groom, how many hours they study or they're in school or their work or their extracurricular activities or they're in the social life. And then at the end of the week, um, or you might do a couple of weeks, actually sit down and analyze it with them. How much time did you waste that you could have been spending on something else? 
What things would you like to try differently the next week? Let the student lead the conversation and often they can really start adjusting their time management on their own. It's hard to do it without knowing how you spend your time. And so that is an absolutely wonderful way. Where can you, you know, you felt frustrated, you had to go to bed so late because you didn't have enough time in your day. What could you have cut back on if you had done this uh, quicker or you had done this in a, in, a, in a more manageable way, would you have had more time to study or even more time to sleep? So the 168 exercise, it's common. I didn't create it. It's all available online if you want to look that up. Uh, there are templates online for the 168 exercise, and it's a fascinating exercise. And it's actually something that I've had some um, high school parents do as well. If you find that you want to manage your time better, um, it works for anybody. Uh, any other question? Is there a good book on college survival for kids as a gift? Andrea's book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Jody. Um, so my book is called How to College, uh, What to Know Before You Go In When You're There. Uh, it's available on my website and on Amazon. Um, I would say another wonderful book is um, Julie lithcott Ham's book, um, How to Raise an Adult. I'm an enormous fan of that book. Um, you know, there are lots of books out there on transitioning, uh, student facing books, uh, parent facing books. Here's what one uh, bit of advice that I would offer is whatever book you're going to buy, take a look and make sure that person who wrote that book has worked on a college campus. There are lots and lots and lots of books about college that are written by parents. Um, and not that they don't have great stuff to offer, but they don't have the experience of seeing, as Jody had mentioned earlier, tens of thousands of first year students and know that development developmental age and know the common problems. So whatever book you purchase, uh, obviously I worked on a college campus many years, Julie lithcott um, was a dean for many, many years um, at Berkeley. There are wonderful books that are out there, but that's something I would absolutely check the bio of the author and make sure that they have worked on a college campus for many years. Any other questions? I actually would say the same thing about those of you who are looking at someone maybe that can help guide you through the college planning process. There's a lot of parents out there who have been through the process and think that, oh, I've been through this. I got my kid into college and um, that that is, uh, you know, I can do this. But, you know, uh, those of us, I, I have a certification from UCLA in college counseling and I'm actually very involved in the Higher Education Consultants Association. So, you know, you want to make sure of all the credentials of anyone that you work with. Will you post this presentation? It is my understanding, Brian, I think that you will be sharing this, um, if you're still there, uh, on your YouTube channel, if anyone, is that right? That's right, yeah, we'll be sharing the video on our YouTube channel. Great. Any other questions before we say goodnight? Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, go Patriots. And uh, hope you guys have um, a wonderful end of the year. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact either one of us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks. Brian, for having Thanks. us. Yeah.